Good afternoon. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for being here. Again, I'm TJ Ewing. I'm Vice President of International Development for Log Me In, uh, based here in Budapest. Uh, and we're one of those companies that Mary talked about this morning, where we have our line guys part of our company. Um, even though we do struggle with being separate from our main sales and marketing groups, which are based in Boston, uh, but we're trying to overcome those hurdles every day. But we're very proud of our group here in Budapest. Now, as promised, I wanted to, to give you a little uh, video to start off to try to maybe get you out of your lunchtime doldrum. And we'll start with that. Thank you, thank you. Oh. So, what do infomercials have to do with selling B2B software? Or agile, or innovation for that matter? Anyone know what the uh, worldwide annual revenue of infomercials are? Anyone want to take a guess? $250 billion, which is about the equivalent of Apple and Microsoft's revenue every year. People are selling stuff that we really don't really need, but getting us to buy $250 billion of products every year. It's magic. It works like magic. This was actually put together by our Executive Vice President of Products, Matt Kaplan, based in Boston. And he presented this at our sales and marketing group, our annual kickoff in January. And his challenge was, look, our end of the day, our business problem is how do we create products that seem like magic to our customers. And actually, we actually have a, uh, a value at LogMeIn that actually is called Simply Possible. It's one of our taglines. We're trying to make our lives of our customers to be simple and to have them create possibilities. Connectivity can create possibilities. But also, it's, it's a value in our company where we're trying to get our employee base to also feel like things are simply possible. That we're not, as we continue to grow, that we're just not stuck. We can actually need to solve real problems. And Matt Kaplan said, look, infomercials actually indemnify, they actually display what simply possible is all about in the most elegant way possible, through the, the art of storytelling. So what do, inform, what do infomercials really do? They have a simple message. The flowsy, use it and you never have to go to the hairdresser again. The magic bullet, it dices and slices everything in 10 seconds, and it really does. The sham wow, it's a towel, it's a sponge. Who wouldn't want you know, a combination, towel, sponge? It's a very simple value proposition. They also have a very simple offer, easy to try. Three monthly payments, money back guarantee. And if you order now, you'll actually throw in an extra set. They make the offer really, really appealing. And they're simple to use. The clapper, clap lights come on, clap, lights go off. They're very simple to use. $250 billion a year are created through this simple formula of success of creating a simple message, a simple offer, and making products simple to use. And Matt was challenging all of us in the company to think the same way. Every one of us from our engineering teams to our marketing people to our sales to our customer support, how can you help us create a simple offer, a simple product that's simple to use, and a simple message that can get out to our customer base and make their lives simply possible. So here's Matt. And when he first came on into the role, which was a couple years ago, you know, he's very much an agile guy. You know, he came up, said, we want to, this, is, this is his product mission, product team mission. 
Let's con conceive, design, build, and deliver products that our customers love. Very much an agile principle. He's also talking about, look, we need to iterate fast. We need to inspect and adapt. Uh, we actually need to go through a process. And actually, if we're faster at it than our competitors, we may have a competitive advantage. But last, he said he really wanted us to create an innovation culture. Well, what does that mean to us? What does the innovation culture mean? It's easy to say, nice to say. Everyone would like to aspire to it, but how do we actually get to get rubber on the road and actually create an innovation culture? And part of what you can see, as I blacked a little bit, but we wanted to create a, a, a culture of risk-taking uh, for our engineers to be able to go out outside of their comfort zone, um, but also self-motivation, and there's some continuous learning there. We wanted to be able to get on this cycle to be able to, to be innovative and to solve our customers' problems. So what do we do? We started talking about it. It's like, okay, what is innovation? What does it mean for us? And Matt said, let's, let's compare it. A lot of times it gets confused with invention. Um, and invention really is creating something new, where innovation is creating something useful. New and useful, two different things, mean quite different together. Now, what Matt actually argued was most of the things that we and our company are going to be selling over the next two, maybe even five years, those inventions are already created. We're going to be actually selling things that are already invented. But where we really can have a competitive advantage is the innovations on top of it. This is the challenge, he said. We need to be able to out-innovate the other competitors that we're in the marketplace with. So we also asked our, 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 our product and engineering groups, who do, you, who do you emulate, who do you think are good innovators in the world? And we had some of the normal uh, companies or names that you would, you would guess, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Musk, Zuckerberg. No one would be shocked to say, yeah, or, or would, would be hard pressed to say these are innovators. But they also have big companies and a lot of people working behind them to make their products and companies successful. But I'd be hard pressed if anyone here could name all three of these people and what they're famous for. These are inventors. Anyone know any of them? Say again? <laughs> it's not Bill Clinton. Yeah, I agree with you. First one, Philo Farnsworth. He actually created the first electronic television. Second, Gary Kildall created the first microprocessor operating system. And the last, Tim Berners-Lee, one of the inventors of the World Wide Web. Things that we use every day, but yet none of these three guys came up on the innovation list. These guys aren't household names. And it turns out, Matt wanted to communicate to all of us, look, inventors and innovators think differently. They're trying to solve different problems. And Matt was really using this to try to focus us to what we could actually do in our company to affect change. He said, look, innovators and inventors, two different things. An innovator is going to pursue uh, to create something new. There's a, there's, a, there's a problem that no one solved before. An inventor is going to go after that where an innovator is going to really look to satisfy a large unmet need. There's actually a defined need out there. Inventors are going to try to solve complex problems, where innovators are solving customer problems. Inventors are really looking to say, how can we fund new inventions? You know, they're looking to, to continue taking the outer bounds of what's possible, where innovators are trying to build a sustainable business. And finally, the results. Inventors, typically, there's a patent where innovators are trying to create wealth, not only for their customers, but for the company. So I was trying to get us our heads around, look, innovation isn't about creating something new. It's not about a new technology. It's about solving a problem that exists today that we can identify. And the good thing, he said, is that we're all wired for it. We're all wired. Everyone, anyone can be an innovator, even though, okay, engineering team, you may think you're your left brain analytical. But you know what? We all have two sides to our brains. We have the analytical side, but we also have the creative side. And given the right context, you can switch. Matter of fact, entrepreneurs are very good at context switching between the two. So if we all have this innate capability of innovation, how do we unlock it? And we also asked our, engin our engineering teams, like, well, what are you, what, what are you missing 
to be able to be more innovative. And, and one, of the, one of the big comments was time. Now the good thing is, innovation can happen 24-7. Our brains are on 24-7. How many people have been out on an exercise or a run and had that, that revelation about some problem, whether it's a family problem or a company issue, and you say, oh, that's, that's, an, that's an idea, I can try that. Because you gave yourself that time and space to get out of your day-to-day -day routine, and that's when the innovation can happen. Matter of fact, we asked our guys, where are you most innovated? innovative? Turns out, it's mostly in the bathroom. Or it's exercising. Or it's on vacation. Or it's in leisure time. And actually, most of those were in, more often than not, they felt more innovative than at work. So how do we give them the time and create some of that space within our organization? And then we ask, you know, what sort of companies do you think embody? And again, very, very common, uh, no shockers with this, Apple, Google, Uber, Amazon, Tesla. Um, but these companies had, have a process. And Matt really distilled it down. He was trying to say, all right, let's keep things really, really simple. Let's look at a very simple four-step innovative process that we can actually take in our company, talk about it, and actually try to get everyone to hone in on this. And when, when I look at it, it seems really overly simplistic, but maybe that's the beauty of it. Step one, let's observe our customer's world. Step two, let's identify the most important problems. Let's solve it, and then measure the results. Again, overly simplistic, but this is what we wanted to get to. And it turns out we've actually been thinking this way for a couple years. So Mike Simon, our, our CEO, asked us to, as a company, we need to engage more closely. And he actually hung these semaphore flags in every one of our offices. And does anyone know what those flags symbolize? They actually symbolize engage more closely. They were put up by Lord Nelson in the Battle of Trafalgar off Spain, and when he wanted his ships to engage more closely in, in the battle. And so Mike challenged all of us and said, look, you know, what you guys need to do is engage more closely across your functions, sales, marketing, product, engineering, customer support. You guys need to start talking a lot, uh, a lot stronger across your groups, and we need to engage much more closely with our customer base. We had some products, we didn't even know exactly the, the, the breakout of what, what the customers were. So we already had prefaced this. So now we talked a lot about it. We, we, we sort of delved into what is innovation. What can it mean for us? We have a little, little model, innovative steps now. But how do we actually then materialize it? What do we actually do? What actions do we put together to try to manifest innovation within our organization and try to be, you know, embody some of the behaviors within our teams? First one was our hackathon. And this was, frankly, a big experiment for us. You know, we went to our executives and said, we want to actually take oh, nearly 400 of our staff and give them the week off to create anything they want. Pretty big investment. Um, but the experiment was really, would our engineers and product teams, in a vacuum, start to think about our customer's world and start to think about some of the problems that those customers have? Would they start that first two steps of our innovative process? Could they do it without any blueprint, without any guidance? And we were astounded at the results. So briefly about the hackathon, uh, we basically said we're going to take a whole week. And engineering and product teams, you can create anything you want. You can do anything you want for that week. Here's the only rules. You just have to create something that has to do something vaguely about our customer bases. That's it. No other rules. You could self-organize your teams. You could work with teams that you know. You could go find somebody else. You could call a sales guy in Boston and, and have them on your team. Anything you want. Tell us what your technical needs are. We'll try to fill them. And at the end of that week, the only thing they had to do is had a five-minute presentation to tell us what their idea was, why it was valuable, the technology they used, anything else they wanted to tell us. And after the... the uh, actual judging, we actually were going to choose 10 of our projects to give a final presentation at our annual development offsite, which was in Portugal, um, in front of the whole product and engineering teams and all of our executives of the company. So there's some bit of glory to this too. The teams who, who actually uh, got to the final 10 had a chance to uh, present in front of the executives their ideas. 
Actually, one, one other comment with that. You know, Matt really looked at this idea as like, all right, this can be a forcing function. You know, we can, we can test the boundaries and see what happens by getting our engineers to start to think about taking risks. How can we get them to actually step outside the normal day-to-day -day and have them participate into the customer problem uh, identification side? So we did a quick survey after, after the hackathon week, and 75% of our, of our participants said they, they felt more innovative during the hackathon. Actually, 60% said they worked longer hours during the hackathon week than they normally do at, at the office. And one of them, Peter, actually said it, he said it best, this was the best week of my career of nine years at Log Me In. And the energy in the building was absolutely palpable. You could feel it. You could walk around and you could see all this hub of activity. Teams were, were engaged. And we wanted to bottle it. We wanted to have this, this, this continued to, to go on past the hackathon. Um, but what was it? You know, we started to say, okay, really, what, what were we measuring? We felt, it, we felt the energy. We, we, we saw the, the actual products, and you'll hear from one of them in, in, in a few minutes. What was it? Was it the, the, the time they spent together? Was it the exercise that some of the teams did? Or was it just the pure fact that the, the teams were sharing some beers after a long day of, of, of hacking night and day? This person summed it up best. We felt more motivated because we had much more freedom to do what we imagined. The feeling was that we owned the product was stronger. This was the power of innovation. They owned their mission. This was our big takeaway, that if we can give teams the ability, the autonomy, and the purpose to own their own mission, they'll go out and dedicate time, energy, way over the top of what they normally would, um, and produce really interesting results. And the lesson we were trying to now take from this, and by the way, there was one product who you'll hear from Gabor, we actually had voting across the whole organization, all 800 employees got to vote on the People's Choice Award, What's they, which one they thought was the most innovative product uh, idea that came out of the hackathon. And we leveraged, we were trying to leverage this idea like, look, everyone saw all of these projects. Everyone saw some of these actually become live. But this is just one little component to what Matt was saying when he was, when he was telling us about infomercials. It's not just what we build, it's how we build it, it's how we sell, it's how we market. Every person in the organization can have an influence on how innovation happens within the company. Innovation just doesn't happen with our CEO, it just doesn't happen with the product manager, it just doesn't happen um, in one team. It happens with every single person in the organization. Um, and this is what we wanted to say. We wanted to, how do we now create the shared ownership, the shared responsibility across the organizations to say, now you can go out and solve these problems, customer problems that we've identified. Some of the few other things that we do, briefly, and then I'll hand it over to Gabor. Um, over the last year, we actually started a customer advisory board. So we took 20 of our largest customers of two of our, two of our biggest products and brought in some of our largest customers to meet with our sales, marketing, product, and engineering teams. We actually opened up our strategy. We started talking about what we're doing with the product, and we wanted to ask them what they saw in the industry and what they were trying to do with their business. It gave us intense insight into our customer base and also gave them a dedicated feeling back to us that we are trying to solve their problems. It's been a huge success for us. We still have FedEx days for our engineering teams. Not every team has an opportunity to do it as often as we'd like, but the idea is like, look, guys, you have a day, two, maybe three days, you guys can do whatever you want to the product. It's yours. You're the product owner, create something. We have real-time analytics, so when we do do activities uh, across our offices, we're trying to measure the results as soon as we can. And this is something new that we're trying actually in April. Uh, we're calling it Customer Hack. So we're bringing over engineering teams from Budapest to our Boston Customer Support Center. And those teams are actually going to sit with our customer support reps and listen in on live customer calls. They're going to hear the pain. They're going to hear how we respond. And at the end of the week, they're all going to sit down together and say, OK, what are the things that we learned this week? What are some of the biggest problems, pain points that our customers have? Engineering team, customer support guys get together, think about some of the problems, and then pick any problems, as many as you can, that you can solve in the following week and launch it, get it out. 
And then our customer support people will go back to those customers and say, we listened, we heard, here's our solution. It's an experiment, we'll see what happens next month. And that goes back to the annual global hackathon. So we'll do another one this year. Uh, but to give you a little bit more insight into actually the hackathon week from one of the, the teams that actually had some stupendous results, let me introduce Gabor Meyer, uh, one of our product owners at LogBN. Thanks, DJ. Hi, everyone. So let me step forward and invite you to a journey about uh, which we've talked about the hackathon and how does it feel to be in a hackathon and in a hackathon team. So as TJ said, the only rules around hackathon is uh, to form a team with other log miners from wherever around the world and also to try to solve a problem which is somehow related to either the business of LogMean or either the customer base of LogMean. So here is the problem or limitation what we wanted to solve. We wanted to solve a limitation of LogMean Rescue in order to uh, get you to the, to the understanding of the problem we were trying to solve. Let me tell you what LogMean Rescue is about. LogMean Rescue is a support tool. You as an end user have a problem with your computer or with your mobile device. You need help, you need technical support. So you contact an agent, and the agent connects remotely to your device and helps you solve that problem. This is how a support session looks like from the agent point of view. Here you can see this is the technician console. It's a component which is installed on the computer of the uh, support agent. and the end user has, in this case, an iPhone 5S device, and they just connect. For this, the agent needs uh, the technician console to be installed uh, on the computer, and the end user who is requesting the support needs the client app to be installed on the mobile device. As you can see, here is a small red arrow, which I um, put there. This arrow is actually an annotation, a whiteboarding feature. So whenever the agent wants to highlight something on the screen of the device to help the customer, help the end user understand how to fix the problem, there's the annotation. The agent can just draw and then erase it. But what happens if the support request is not about a mobile. It's not about a computer either. It's about something what you cannot install the client app on. It's about a garage door, for example. How do you support a garage door when there's no screen to annotate on? There's no device to install the client app on. So the idea is Let's get the camera stream, deliver it to the screen, and extend that limited canvas of the mobile device's screen and make the canvas as big as the world around the person holding the mobile device. And the canvas can grow as big as you can show with your mobile device's camera. And this is what you can see. It's, uh, the camera uh, image is streamed onto the uh, mobile device screen, and it is directly uh, streamed also to the agent console. And that was the product, what the uh, Hackathon project was about. But uh, the idea could have been cool, but it was not cool enough, we felt. So we wanted to take it even further, because what happens when you are requesting your help and you've got an annotation, but then your hand is a little bit shaking or you move your camera, what happens then? The, the annotation can move and then you lost track, you cannot fix your issue, so it's not a help. So let's take it even further. Let's make the annotation stay at place. Let's use some image recognition to keep the focus on the area where you have the chance to fix that issue. And this is what the new product, product does, and this is what that idea was about. 
what were the steps what we had to go through? We had to build a product in one week. Then we had to present it by the end of the week of the hackathon to the judges. Then we had to present it uh, to the uh, bigger crowd if we uh, qualify to the finals. And then the biggest challenge, of course, was to make it a product. So let's go through each of these steps one by one. During the hackathon week, it was five days long. So the first couple of days uh, were spent uh, with the development work. Then after the uh, development, halfway through the week, LogMeIn provided the chance for each of the team to talk to one of the senior members of the company and get advice, get some feedback about the project and get some advice about how to present it the best way. Because it was not just uh, challenging to create something good, but it was also challenging to present it good enough so everybody believes that, okay, this project is entitled for something bigger, something more than the other ones. Of course, uh, during this week, the expectation was to create something from idea to a prototype state, but it was not required to make it all the way up to the product level, so you didn't have to think about scalability or localization or stability or anything like that. But still, it had to be a working prototype, what you can demonstrate. So presentation to the judges, the big day came on Friday. Floor 5 of the LogMe in Budapest office, more than 100 uh, people in the audience. For those engineers who never present, that's a big challenge. Everybody is wringing the hand, nobody talks too much, everybody is feeling nervous, have the butterfly in the stomach, stepping on stage and starting to talk about the project. But the time came, and when this project was introduced, the crowd went completely quiet. And as the annotation was drawn on the picture, and the camera was moved, and the hand was shaked, and based on the image recognition, the drawing just stayed at place, kept on the focus, everybody just started clapping. And it was pretty unusual, and it was a great moment, because none of those projects before uh, being presented before had this uh, great result of uh, having uh, hands clapped uh, during the presentation. So by that time, everybody knew that, OK, this project is probably one of those 10 best projects uh, to be presented to the bigger crowd in the LogMeans yearly offsite. So here was the next challenge. How do you present, as an engineer, to a bigger group, a group of 300, including C-level executives of the company? We knew that we had to do something which makes the project purpose clearly understandable. So we decided, OK, we want to shoot a video, so not to screw up the presentation right there when we need to do it, and we've got only one chance. So we wanted to shoot a video, but there was no time. We had to submit all the materials around the project because there was a deadline. So we decided, okay, let's shoot this video overnight. We started at 7 o'clock in the evening, and we ended up around 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. rendering the video. But we, but we did it. We could manage uh, to get the video done. And um, it was, again, successful because we've been selected as the people's choice uh, out of all the 10 finalist projects. But the challenge, of course, was not that big over there compared to what we were facing after the hackathon week. Because the biggest challenge is really to productize this and to build it, to integrate it with other parts of the, of the product and to make it really a, a seamless flow for those customers who are requesting some help uh, from, the, from the technicians. And how it works, it uses a technology, what we can say now, it's applied for a patent. So it's not just innovation, but it's also something what we can consider invention at the time. And that's how great uh, LogMeIn did, because uh, generating some innovation within the company actually ended up with some invention as well. 
So let's see what the product does in practice, because yesterday there was a press re release where this product was announced to the public. So all the way from August until now, the team has been working hard to make it happen and to transform the idea through a hackathon project into a real product. And now we can state it is out there and available for any rescue customers. So let's meet Gary, who's got a problem with the garage door. For most companies, the hardest part of customer support is that often it takes longer to identify the problem than it does to actually solve it. Introducing Rescue Lens, the first true customer-assisted support solution. Lens allows your customers to show you the problem rather than having to explain it. So customer service agents see exactly what the customers see. To illustrate, meet Gary. He's in a bit of a hurry to make that 9 a.m. staff meeting. And now this, the garage door won't close. For a guy like Gary, this could easily derail his entire day. But it doesn't have to. Let's look at how things would be different if he were using lens. Same Gary, same garage door opener. But it's a completely different scene. The CS agent can see everything Gary sees. Okay, I think I've identified the problem. And easily directs him to the problem areas. Even if he moves his phone, he doesn't lose his place. Gary without lens isn't making that meeting. In fact, he may not make it to work at all today. But Gary with lens, he's just a few screwdriver twists from being on his way. That should do it. Nice work. He's making that 9 a.m. meeting, and he's got time to stop for donuts. For most companies, so that was the Hockathon project, and that's how it became a product. And um, that's the end of the presentation. Thanks for your attention. If you want to provide us feedback, please use the colored small sticky notes on the door behind you. We would appreciate your feedback. Thank you. We have a couple minutes if anyone has any quick questions. We have the mic coming up. We'll use, we'll use this one. So, how did you prepare for the hackathon? I mean, either the organizer, uh, organizers, or the management, or the or the staff itself. So, how much? Uh, so who organized? The no, no, no. How much and how did you? Uh, how much time did you spend on the preparation of the hackathon, and how organized it was, or it was just announced that okay, you got uh, five days to work on it? Yeah. So it it was. Uh, I would say it was a little bit rushed. Uh, we sort of, Matt uses this term, let's plant a flag. So we planted a flag, we're gonna do a hackathon. Okay, let's figure that out. And we had a small committee of volunteers that basically said, okay, I'll help organize it. So we started to figure out what do we need to communicate, what uh, infrastructure do we need in place at, at the time, who's gonna be judges, how's the judging work, you know, the whole, the whole enchilada. So really it was a small committee of people that worked, um, you know, many hours, months ahead of time beforehand, but, but everyone kind of knew once Monday hit, go. You start with your teams and, and go. And everyone kind of made it up as they went. Hi. Uh, we are also organizing uh, hackathons in my company. Uh, but uh, one thing that I'm wondering is um, you don't know who the winner will be. And uh, the winner is going to productize his uh, idea. How is it about uh, planning of his work or the team? I mean, what uh, does, uh, did uh, his manager said? I mean, the team who won the hackathon, yeah. they, are going, uh, they worked hard from August uh, until March. Isn't it like that? So how did it suit with the other planning things? Uh? Yeah, regarding to this, uh, it, was, it was not like uh, these guys did the hackathon project, they won it, so now they can productize. It was not about that. Uh, but the hackathon winner projects were considered as part of the regular roadmap. 
and as soon as they were found interesting enough and attractive enough uh, from market opportunity point of view, the uh, business owners together with the product owners just put it on the roadmap and then the whole team was focusing on the uh, actual project and the productization of that. So it's not like two guys making it from the idea to the product. It's it, in that occasion, it was a whole team doing it. I'll add one, I'll add one thing. Uh, there was actually also two things after the, the, the hackathon event. Uh, so Matt, who I talked about, actually told all the product teams, like, look, you have, we had over 50 projects. Some of them were spectacular products or ideas. And Matt challenged the product teams, like, how many of you guys will actually be able to implement any of these ideas into the product and, and how long will it take you? So we kind of set the bar and challenged them to say, okay, look, you had all these great ideas, these great, these great things. Which one of you guys and product teams are actually going to go out there and actually make some of these reality? What happened with, with Lens, um, we actually started to, to sh talk about this with customers. And for one of the very first times in our company's history, a customer actually said, how fast can you have this ready because I will buy now. As soon as we heard that, yes. that was, it, it, it validated every, it validated us planting that original flag and made everyone who kind of were like, okay, this may be fun, we'll get some interesting things out of it, but is it really going to affect our business? As soon as we heard one of our customers said, I will buy it today, of reality hit. Thank you. Is that it? Okay. Well, we'll be around this afternoon. Thanks.